Are we on? We're on. All right. Okay, so we can't talk about gossip anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're just saying it's so glad to see so many of you showed up because we're at the the end of the day, the end of the summit, and you know, I'm sure, you know, all of you must be pretty exhausted. I am. I actually have lost my voice, and I'm so glad that you are here. And um, you know, I guarantee this panel is worth your time. We got this esteemed panelists here, and um, you'll at least pick up a couple of new things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Annie Lai. Uh, let me just introduce myself, and I work for Huawei. And uh, one fun part of my job is um, I do travel a lot. I travel around the world. I've, you know, ever since I joined Huawei, I've been to like over 30 plus countries and all like five continents. You know, talking to OpenStack, you know, users and customers. And one thing I learned is, um, you know, one of the reasons that you know um, customers are choosing OpenStack is interoperability because they think with interoperability, there's no vendor lock-in because, you know, especially a lot of CTOs, they have experienced the pain of being, you know, controlled under by one vendor or two vendors. And, and I heard average, like, CTOs job life, life um, span for their position is like three years. So they got smart. They don't, they want their architecture to be fully open and they want their solution to be, you know, fully interoperable. So that's why we're here today to explore further, you know, the definition, the meaning of interoperability, and you know the the promise that you will deliver. So, all right, um, that's let me introduce you to uh, the panels, and um, I think they are all pretty famous. You probably know them already. <laughs> you know, they are frequent speakers at the OpenStack summits. And first, I have Brad, who is from IBM, is also uh, OpenStack board director. And um, later, I'm gonna let them talk about their involvement in interoperability, the subject. And Agli, um, also she's uh, OpenStack, you know, um, everybody knows her. She's been here for a long time, and um, she's also, um, sit she's been sitting on OpenStack board for quite a few years now. My third. Third year, wow. Wow, so um, that's, uh, I mean, Agli has been doing tremendous work at the board level as well as at various, in various work groups. And we have Kurt, um, who is from uh, uh, T-Systems. And um, Kurt, before um, their deployment of OpenStack, and you know, you got involved even before the deployment of uh, Deutsche Telekom, uh, OTC, Open Telecom Cloud. So he definitely has experienced um, the process of this whole interoperability. So later I'm gonna talk, um, ask him some tough questions about you know, his experience about interoperability. So, okay, um, so I have said enough, and um, for my f first question um, for the panelists is, um, what's your role in interoperability? At work, in the community, what's your role? Okay, so I'm, I'm Brad. Um, I've, uh, for sort of two releases now, been the, the, the overall lead of the interoperability challenge. Uh, you know, it, it focuses uh, what we see up on the keynotes, and it's a very holistic approach uh, to interoperability. You know, there's something special about getting everybody up there and having to run the same stuff with, based on the same scripts. Really uh, helps to make interoperability a pragmatic discussion as opposed to a philosophical or theoretical one. <laughs> and you gotta get everybody up there and they're gonna have to do their things. Um, so I've, I've been uh, involved from that, from that portion. Um, also the, the, the PTL for RefStack, which is the interoperability project. Um, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, Catherine Dieppe, who's in the audience there, works for me as well. Okay, Agli? So my name is Agli Ziegler, and uh, I work for Axpace. I have been on OpenStack board for now, it's my third year, mm -hmm. and uh, I am a co-chair of Interoperability Working Group. If you have heard of DEF Corps Committee before, it's the same thing. Um, we just renamed it to be uh, maybe easier to understand. What Interoperability Committee uh, Working Group focuses on is um, c d defining standards or guidelines for what it means to run OpenStack. So if you are uh, working on a product that calls itself OpenStack 
private cloud or OpenStack uh, distro or OpenStack something else. You have to go to the foundation and uh, uh, acquire license uh, to use the logo. Uh, so one thing that foundation will ask you is have you passed the interoperability guidelines and uh, we're the ones that actually govern the guidelines. So the working group is governed from the uh, by OpenStack Foundation board, but we also need community input. So we also have a uh, elected co-chair from community, and anyone is welcome to get involved in our working group and help us with, with those standards or guidelines. Uh, right now, the guidelines are um, more like of a spec. It, just because you pass the guideline doesn't mean that uh, you have fully functional open stacks, a lot more features that we're not including in the spec, but that's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about those later. And you, Kurt? Yeah, well, first let me confirm that the, the interoperability group is very open, welcoming to new people, so I've oh, experienced it myself. Oh, <laughs> you just sign up? Good. No, well, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we need help, we need we lots need help. of help. Yeah. So, no, but I'm, yeah, I'm, attending and joining already since, since a bit and period of time. And I really felt welcome from the first day. So that was good. And interoperability actually is an important topic for us because a lot of the discussions we have with our customers, they tell us, mm -hmm. well, um, we have chosen your platform, Open Telecom Cloud, because um, we did not want to have this lock-in effect. Mm -hmm. And um, <coughs> they ask us, well, how can you show us and prove mm -hmm. us that actually that is the case, that works? And then this, uh, uh, OpenStack powers and the uh, interop program is, is really an important piece of the answer mm -hmm. to that question. And that's why it's important to our customers, that's why it's important to us, and that's why we participate in, mm -hmm. uh, in that community. Yeah. Can you share with the audience what's you know, DTOTC, Deutsche Open Telecom Cloud, what exactly is that? Because some people here might not know, or well, even though they should. <laughs> 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 no, uh, thanks for asking. I mean, we, we launched a um, public cloud based on OpenStack uh, more than a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's a global cloud, but we started in Germany, which is where the largest part of our customer base is. And one of the USPs that we do have is uh, to be able to fulfill the European data protection and mm -hmm. uh, data privacy and security concerns and laws. Mm -hmm. and, and that is one of the things that has prevented some of our customers mm -hmm. to, to use the cloud so far. And now they have that possibility. So it's one of the, the things we do there. Perfect, great. And um, I want to go back to Brett, what Brett said. Um, interoperability is a big word, overloaded word. And um, everybody has some idea of what interoperability is. And the discussion sometimes can get to a pretty philosophical. So let's just talk about that in a you know, more idealistic way. What's your vision of what interoperability should be you know, in the end, that customers can truly benefit the promise of interoperability? Right, so you need to be a little bit careful. Um, you know, typically as you go down a, a process of, you know, in an co open source community to drive interoperability, you're going to start with things like RefStack, where you're defining, you know, what, what needs to be done and what everybody needs to implement, and um, there'll be certification tests and people will do that. But we have to remember the true test for interoperability is what the user experience is. So if the things that cause interoperability problems are the choice of automation for how they deploy and provision, for example, not all the clouds support uh, OpenStack Heap, not all the clouds uh, support Terraform, that customer or user or operator experience is gonna be, hey, this stuff isn't interoperable. I went and I was doing my stuff with Heat over here and then I went to this person's cloud and it didn't work. They don't wanna hear that you're gonna say, yeah, but, but, but but both places passed all the tests, <laughs> right? So we have to remember, it's an end-to-end -end experience of can we make it incredibly simple for a, an operator or a user to say, you know, and this is how we like to say it from a marketing perspective, you know, you know Brad, we're using your cloud, and God forbid you decide that you want to stop using my IBM cloud, at least you can easily move to another vendor and you can go to Annie's cloud or Egley's mm -hmm. cloud. And yeah, you know, at the same and, and since that's okay, I can maybe then go and you know sell you services anyway because we're all on the same platform. But the nice thing to you as as a customer operator is that freedom from vendor lock-in. You know, mm -hmm. um, we used to have these stories that you know if you go to a proprietary cloud or what have you, 
um, in the 1970s, we had a little commercial called the, uh, the Roach Motel, where the roaches would check in but never check out. <laughs> we like you to be able to, you know, yeah. God forbid, I don't make you happy, you should be able to check out, you should go to Egle, you go to, yeah. you know, Annie, whoever. So yeah. that holistic approach, that's the proof is in the pudding. And then me showing up with these little spreadsheets and checklists saying, but we both pass, that just doesn't count from a, from a user. Yeah. What about Kurt? You're a large user, right? And the interoperable user say it's very important to you. So for DTOTC, what would be the true vision of interoperability that's going to help you differentiate DTOTC from like Amazon and these guys? Well, you, you bring up Amazon. So, I mean, Oops. Amazon has this, this, <laughs> Probably I should this, have this, this world domination piece. Right. I mean, they are they're bu building this huge cloud, hugely successful. Um, and I mean, it, it, a lot of the things they do, they do well. Uh, there's no point not acknowledging that. But I think the OpenStack community has a different vision. Mm -hmm. The vision uh, having many clouds, smaller clouds, that somehow can connect together um, mm -hmm. and together be stronger. Um, private clouds, public clouds, mm -hmm. really allowing customers to choose what best fits their needs. Um, mm -hmm. And then to, to relatively easily move from one to the other and use some combination of these and expect that to be, right. to be a seamless experience. Right. And that's kind of the vision we Right. We wanted to build as an OpenStack community, and um, which we still have to work on a bit more to, to, to get there. Right. You know, I, I, I also have a perspective because, um, you know, Huawei, we also enable public cloud and private clouds. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that's going to set us apart from all those proprietary cloud platform is our interoperability value proposition. So, you know, we, we have, you know, Red Hat, Ubuntu, you know, SUSE, and then all these, you know, private clouds, and then we have DTOTC. It, customers environment, especially enterprise customer environments are gonna be hybrid. So they're gonna have you know, specific usage for private cloud, specific usage for public cloud. If all these clouds are OpenStack powered, and later Agri is gonna describe what that means, and then you know, they can be interoperable, then that means workloads can be you know, migrated, you know, back and forth, can run back and forth, you know, uh, to meet various um, requirements, and we can do that. And you know, and I think that makes OpenStack's value proposition a lot stronger. Um, that's my perspective. So, so going back to Eckley, and um, so, uh, so from what I just said, um, you know, the, with the current um, OpenStack branding, like OpenStack powered, OpenStack compatible, you know, we have all these trademarks. And um, can you give us some background about why we need those trademarks and what they mean and how they can help us achieve the ultimate vision of interoperability? So first of all, Brad is very right that yes, there is a checklist, but just because you pass the checklist doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect. Uh, so what the foundation uh, has done are basically, we help them create a bare minimum to achieve uh, the certification. Um, to, so right now, if you go to the foundation and you say, I want to call my product uh, OpenStack Cloud, uh, you have three options. You can either get OpenStack Powered Platform, OpenStack Powered Compute, or uh, OpenStack Powered Storage. Uh, platform covers both storage and compute. Uh, compute is uh, Nova, Keystone, Cinder, Neutron. It does not include Swift. Um, the storage component is Keystone plus Swift. Uh, so what that means if, is if you're running uh, all these main projects, um, you can uh, get the OpenStack Power Platform logo. If you are running uh, Nova, Keystone, Neutron, and uh, Cinder, and Ceph, you can get only Compute because Ceph is not an OpenStack project and it does not cover the OpenStack storage component. Even though you may be able to pass the uh, APIs for the storage component because you're not running OpenStack code, you're not, uh, you're not going to get the OpenStack powered platform logo just because you're not running all of the code. And that's the very important distinction uh, API, uh, passing APIs is not enough. We do, ex uh, we do expect that you are running OpenStack code, not just another re-implementation uh, of the APIs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think I covered all of the Questions? main 
uh, main aspects. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we don't have a compatible program, uh, and you just get the three <coughs> different, uh, you could get three different logos. Oh, I think there is a training program, training. but we're, we're not concerned with that in our interoperability working group. We are talking about adding uh, different uh, uh, programs. Uh, one of them is add-on, and another one is vertical. Add-on would be something like uh, if you want, if you are running additional components like designate, and you want to say differentiate your cloud and say, hey, I have OpenStack with DNS. So right now we're working on creating uh, this. Uh, the vertical program would be something like uh, uh, NFV ready OpenStack, and we're working with Open NFV community to figure out what that would look like and what that would mean. So, but that that's. That's in the future. Mm. Well, that's very much in, um, you know, uh, alignment with what Mark um, was saying. You know, and during his keynote, is composable architecture. Open site is a composable architecture, so the users can, you know, pick and choose whatever building blocks they need to help them, you know, meet the requirements of various use cases. Right. So that's awesome. Um, so open set. So wh wh why do you think it's important to get that open set power and open set? Well, compatible is not to, oh, let's just focus on power. Trademark, wh why do, you, you know, I know um, the community manager who's responsible for all these, um, you know, tests are, is Chris Hodge, right? right? He's constantly pushing people, hey, you're gonna need to get certified, you know, so you can earn the right to have the, to use the OpenStack power trademark. And why is that so important for vendors and service providers and users? I think uh, it's probably most important for users because as a user you may uh, assume that anybody that calls themselves OpenStack are actually running the same thing. Yeah. When in fact those of you that have ever installed OpenStack, you know that you can fine tune every aspect uh, of each project. I think uh, just a policy file for Nova alone, you have over 400 different options. So you can turn everything off or turn everything on for everyone and everything in between. So as a user, you don't know that or you don't want to know that and you don't want to care about it. And you're like, I, just give me something that creates VMs, gets IPs, have some networking, maybe some storage and uh, so just some basic cloud things. Um, so that's what the uh, logo program mm -hmm. is meant to help with. Uh, so if someone calls themselves OpenStack, that mm -hmm. they at least have the bare, bare minimum mm -hmm. where they can go and create VMs and get some networking and right. some storage. Right. Uh, for, from operator's perspective, I think it uh, encourages them not to go and create too, too many customizations. Um, if, if you create something custom, then you also have to maintain it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you get too far away from uh, trunk or mainstream open stack, then you're not going to have an easy time right. um, in six months or a year when you need to upgrade. Right. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, Agri has done, and uh, Interop World Group, uh, they have done tremendous work. It's a lot of work to, you know, push out these programs. And um, so I just want to give a shout out. They are doing an amazing job. And just to help you make your life easier, can you share with the audience that what kind of help you need? Because we don't want you to be losing your sleep and working on this all the time. So get help. And yes, if you are uh, passionate about a particular project and you think we sh there should be an add-on, for example, uh, DNS, uh, database, heat, uh, or orchestration, and you really want to see that come to life sooner rather than later, uh, well, come and tell us about it and we'll say, we'll we'll let you know how you can help us. If you are passionate about any other aspect about OpenStack, same thing. Mm -hmm. we, we can probably use your help there. Um, interoperability working group is really a about documentation and procedure and process. Uh, we do need help writing additional Tempest tests. Uh, if, if that's something that you are interested in, we'll, you tell us, we'll, we'll let you know what kind of tests we need help with. But uh, a lot of it, a lot of the work is not really glorious. It's uh, documentation and process and making sure that we're 
testing the right things and that the program is mm -hmm. uh, doing what it's supposed to do, that we are protecting the open stack yeah. uh, trademark and that people that have that trademark actually have open stack and mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's a balancing act because if, you, if you're running a private cloud and Annie is running public cloud, well, the requirements will be different. So that's why uh, right now we're just a bare minimum that everybody agrees on. Right, so, you, you still, so there's still um, a way to make this whole program, uh, you know, to meet the requirements of interoperability, there's still yeah. a way there. So please, you know, help volunteer and participate. Um, so from the other side of the coin, um, from a user or big operator standpoint, Kurt, you went through the pain of getting your DTOTC certified, or you know now your DTOTC is OpenStack powered, you know um, platform. And can you share with the audience the experience of you know going through that whole process? And can you can you tell us give some give us some tips on you know for uh, any kind any company or any user wants to go through that certification process? What kind of things they you know they need to be aware of, and you know so they don't have to go through the pain that you went through. Yeah, I, after all, I don't think it was that painful, but oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, well, fortunately, yeah. But I, I mean, indeed, we started before we launched because I wanted to have um, kind of um, make sure we're doing the right thing, and um, mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure we have kind of a, a baseline test that uh, tells us about the, mm -hmm. about the quality of our platform. Um, and I, I wanted to make sure we push the right people the right way, our vendor, ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then as soon as we had launched, actually we had a lot of customer discussions and then they were the ones pushing us uh, to make sure um, we have a good That's answer to that question. To that question. <laughs> um, we're not your you, vendor, we're your partner. compatible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, what we did is actually we, we put two people on the job um, mm -hmm. part-time, um, and they set up a bit of infrastructure as they wow. we, we actually run our own for, for some reason that we initially had to find a way to kind of um, limit down the list of tests we perform and not always have the whole ten yeah. tests which we run. Um, because we knew some of them would fail and then screw up the environment. And some yeah. th there can be some, some complications. Um, we did all that and then uh, I think that was kind of the, the initial investment that we had to do to, to learn how it works and to interpret and to learn mm -hmm to understand, okay, there are some duplicates because there's some name aliasing and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, make sure we uh, understand the counting uh, to, to measure how far we're away from the, the final results. Um, and then I think we pushed a bit of um, work on our partner, indeed, um, who had to, to <laughs> fix a few bugs. We endure and then we, the pain. We, we get there. <laughs> yeah, we endure the pain for you. <laughs> I'm glad you, f you feel painless. <laughs> that's our job. <laughs> okay, so, um, so that's good. Um, so now I'm going to, uh, back to Brad. Uh, mm -hmm. So you were talking about, um, you know, the interoperability challenge and, um, you know, not, I'm sh not many people, uh, not everybody knows. I'm sure you have seen the demo and stuff. We like to have the understanding of what happened in the background, how you made, how, you know, how you pulled all these companies together huh. and, you know, do the test and run the test and do the live demo. And, you know, what purpose does it ser uh, serve? Right, so this is going back to the beginning because it's fun history. This was um, um, OpenStack Summit Austin. Um, my IBM general manager, Don Rippert, uh, had a presentation and he made it clear as part of the presentation that the issues the OpenStack community were facing that he was seeing when he talked to customers and analysts and, and that the two big things originally that, 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 that we were getting dinged on was show us you can really run enterprise applications and show us that, that, that inter, uh, OpenStack is truly interoperable. So as part of his presentation, he threw down the gauntlet in Austin and said, um, I think we should have an interoperability challenge. Who's with me, right? And um, then he collected up all the cards. Um, yeah, who's with you? That's yeah. right. He participated of both well, times. Well, did. Yeah. And so, the, you know, the, the, the funny thing was, you know, so, you know, you have your general manager gets up there and collects all the cards, and you're sitting there as the distinguished engineer going, wow, I bet this is going to roll down as work for me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so what we did and how we did this, uh, myself and my boss, Todd Moore, and way back when, is we went to all the OpenStack Foundation board members 
and we said, okay, well, uh, so-and-so from your company gave us our card, and, and Don collected all the cards, and uh, we want to have this interoperability challenge and show that things are interoperable. And so we would, went to all the board members, and everybody got buy-in, and, and what you do is you say, okay, well, not only buy-in, I need a technical lead. So tell me the person who's your technical lead. So you had to do this, this round of management to go around and say, okay, we're getting all these technical leads from all these folks who are gonna participate. Um, and what we started doing is, okay, well, we need a really nice enterprise workload. This is way back when, right? We're getting ready for Barcelona. Uh, we need a nice enterprise workload. Well, I don't really see one. And then you look for somebody who's like, well, who do we think can build a really nice enterprise workload? And the name that popped into my head was a guy named Tong Lee. He's sitting right there. <laughs> and uh, Tom Tommy's built- Tommy's a hero. <laughs> Tom was a hero. He built us a, um, uh, a LAMP stack application. He also did some work. Uh, we had some folks in IBM who built a Docker Swarm app. And whenever you're trying to do something across a community, um, in, an all, in a perfect world, everybody contributes evenly on the hard part kind of things, but the reality is these are all very busy people doing part-time things, and you need those folks that are gonna really lose sleep over this all coming together and can serve as rovers and help. And um, you know that's a lot of things that Tong did, helping all the different folks, trying different things out, and we learned as we went. Everybody had a lot of great ideas. Well, we think we ought to use heat for, for automated deployment. Well, we think we ought to use Juju Charms. Well, we think we ought to use Terraform. Well, we think we ought to use Ansible. And the beauty of that environment was, you know, the guns to your head, what's gonna work? Ansible worked, just, just let you know. You know, let me ruin the surprise. Ansible was the thing that worked, and uh, you know, Tong would look at me and go, Ansible keeps being the thing that works, Brad. We gotta keep using that. And so, um, you know, getting ready for that first one in Barcelona, um, we learned a lot of lessons. We got uh, everything coming out, and uh, we got everybody up on stage in Barcelona for the first time. Um, that was a lot of pressure. My general manager was on stage six feet behind me, and we've never done this before. And when I think about it, who, what kind of crazy person puts 16 different clouds with 16 different networks and says, let's put them up on the big screen and see who's running? Yeah. So we did all that, and that went great. Um, and then we moved into this phase two of, uh, that I talked about at the thing, I don't want to take up too much time, but the, then there's the phase two of moving into, well, let's look at Kubernetes, multi-cloud, Cockroach DB, and, and all the fun in between with all that. Oh, that's awesome. So we want to thank Brad and your team for such a tremendous effort, because you know you. this is definitely, it's an important milestone of uh, interoperability. And we got a lot of press out of the, the two demos that we had. That was impressive, so thank you. Thank you. And also, thank I want to thank Agri and the, and then um, Kurt for participating. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, they both have participated both times, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. So that's awesome. And then Tong Lee too. I mean, he's the hero who works mm -hmm. behind the scenes. So, yeah. So anyway, um, so that's what community is about, right? We all have to chip in, and that's good. And so um, I have uh, a few more questions. I'd like to open up for the audience to ask questions. Do you have any? specific question about interoperability, and um, these guys are all interoperability experts, so this is an awesome opportunity to ask some questions in this subject. And please go to the mic if you have any questions, so, because we're being recorded. No question? Are you interoperable? <laughs> yeah, all this one, okay. Brothers gonna appreciate this. So we now have people doing uh, uh, putting uh, ARM processors and other type of processors in clouds. So you're talking about interoperability, and for me, you, you're you're just like assuming everything runs in Intel. What about interoperability across different types of CPU? So actually, uh, this this time during the challenge, uh, I wouldn't have anyone running on a different. Uh, architecture, but uh, last time uh, in Barcelona we did, there was uh, someone from Lenaro running on ARM, on ARM. ARM processor, so it, it worked just fine, and uh, if you watch the, the keynote, you'll, you'll hear Gemma talk about it, uh, mm -hmm. about the processor, but. Right, and so ARM did work, but some processors have issues, and, and you know, that's the beauty of, you wanna be up on the stage, you're gonna have to find a way to make things work, and so those issues can pop up. Gotta use a mic. Hmm. 
actually, I just want to add a little bit to that question. Um, at the lunchtime, actually, I was just happened sitting with uh, a guy from Cray, mm -hmm. and he told me that uh, they run OpenStack on their system. So I encouraged him to participate next time the interrupt mm -hmm. because Cray is a little bit different architect. Yeah. But uh, I, I mean, from what he told me already, that uh, they're running OpenStack on Cray. Yeah, I think Great. that's awesome. Great. And uh, IBM has OpenStack running on Open Power, correct? Yeah, and we have potential for next time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. Any more questions? If not, I have one question. My last question for the panel. So um, you know, um, so we talked a lot about you know, um, the vision of interoperability in the beginning, and um, and then we're definitely putting a lot of efforts to kind of push our community to work towards that. And But moving forward as a community, whether, you know, you are a developer or user, what should we do, and or what should we be thinking about in order to reach the, the perf you know, the Ivana of interoperability for, you know, our users, and they can truly we can truly say interoperability is the biggest differentiator. Well, not because it's a, it's a huge differentiator of OpenStack, you know, while it's being compared against all those proprietary platforms. Yeah, so I mean, I'd like to see, a, you know, a catalog of, of just a variety of workloads that we can just feel comfortable that, that run. And, uh, you know, maybe there'll be slightly different profiles. You know, we also did a lot of work on the NFD side. We didn't talk a lot about it, but there was a different uh, session on it. But it would be great, you know, Nirvana is, you can go and see, you know, the proof is in the pudding, you know. Here are the 10 to 15 workloads that, that we're confident are gonna run on all these different platforms. They're in a variety of different domains. Here are the ones that are for NFV. Here's the ones that are just general uh, mm -hmm. you know, OpenStack. And uh, having that confidence and people being able to look at the best practices. Everything's done in the open in these, in these, in these uh, challenges. You can, you, know, you can watch our progress in our IRC meetings. You can watch our, watch our progress in the repositories and you know, what's been submitted to the Ansible scripts and what's been working. And ideally, you know, everybody could really gain and benefit from those best practices from, from uh, all those different workloads. Yeah, and uh, I would like to add to that. Mm. If you are operator, uh, do what Kurt did. Uh, first look what is required to pass interoperability guidelines. It's not a whole mm. lot. I think total, it's, uh, you have to pass about 200 tests, <coughs> uh, API tests in total. So that's mm. not a whole bunch. So please be sure that your product can pass at least that. If you are a developer, uh, also please take a look at what's there and don't try to create something completely different. I think right now we're facing challenges uh, with Octavia and uh, Elbaz having slightly different APIs or slightly different endpoints. So don't, don't try to be too creative. Uh, <laughs> you know, whether you're operator or developer, follow standards, follow guidelines, and yeah. you know, meet those, and then build on top of that. Don't try to deviate from that. That's not going to make your product special. It's going to give you a, a, a headache later on when you're trying to pass the gu guidelines. And if you are having issues with the guidelines, come talk to us. It, we do make mistakes, and sometimes we need to flag or remove uh, a particular guideline, and that's fine. You know. Don't assume that we're unapproachable. We definitely will work with you, try to figure out what's going on and whether you have a good reason to implement something the way uh, you want it to for a good reason or if it's just something that, well, it's probably not a good practice. I mm -hmm. can also confirm that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Kurt, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I guess resisting the temptation to differentiate in the wrong areas um, is something that is very important that each of us needs to remember. Yep. Um, some vendors are, ha have learned over the time to, to, to understand this better than others, and, and I think we all as a community grow. Um, taking it maybe a step further, I mean, we are covering a, a baseline with the Interop um, Working Group and the, the Power Program. Um, and of course, the next steps you described, they will help us to, to actually yeah. make this make life quite a bit better with the vertical programs and the, the add-ons. Yeah, uh, yes. we, need to, we need to make those successful and put them into action. But I also think we, we, will, we will need to go even further with that to, to be able to actually 
live up to the vision of having like federated clouds that can work together yeah. and look seamless to the customers. And I mean, there's things like discoverability, which we have not really covered right. in the intro program. Mm -hmm. um, other things we need to we need to tackle uh, to 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 be successful there. I agree. Uh, right now, the the current programs they they're not meant to be. They're just meant to be the very minimum. You can mm -hmm. add anything you want on top of that. For as long as the minimum, as long as you meet the minimum, uh, you can implement all of the projects, expose everything to your customers. Uh, don't let that stop you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think um, I hope that was informative, and I like to. Uh, you know, thank our um, esteemed panelists, and thank you so much for sharing so much valuable knowledge with us. And I'd like to thank the you know audience for your participation. Thank you. And thanks, Annie. Thank you, thanks, Annie. Annie. Thank you.